Blog Talk Radio. Choices, decisions, frustrations, and pain. Knowing I'm going to forget her someday. While I still can, I'll challenge all my loved ones, every friend, to look inside their hearts and understand that I. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. We're going to have a great program for you today. I'm very excited about talking about this global vision, and we are also going to have a surprise guest on top of uh, the people from Alzheimer's Disease International. Kathy Greenblatt's going to be with us, and she is just doing a fabulous project. She's a uh, sociologist that has uh, just done some beautiful photography around dementia and caregiving and end of life, and um, we're going to be able to have a discussion with her as well. But before we get into the meat of our program, we always get new listeners, and so I like to share with everybody exactly um, who Alzheimer's Speaks is and what we're about. And Alzheimer's Speaks, bottom line, is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. We believe in joining forces and sharing knowledge and having those everyday conversations about life with dementia so that we can remove the stigmas and the myths attached to memory loss and help people in the trenches take back their lives and live with purpose. Together, I personally believe that we can help everyone have a much better understanding of this disease and to work together as a community, as one um, to defeat it. At our core, again, we believe collaboratively we can win this battle. And, um, you know, we were honored by Dr. Oz and ShareCare as being the number one influencer on the Internet for Alzheimer's disease, and we did not do that alone. We did that through all of you participating and being advocates. All it takes is to like us and tweet us, to email an episode, share it with your LinkedIn groups or your Pinterest or your Google. Um, So while you're listening to the show, if you wouldn't mind just hitting those buttons, those small little clicks are so powerful because this is not about any one of us. This is about all of us um, becoming more aware and educated and, again, sharing the knowledge and the journey of dementia. So you can, uh, you can join with us and, uh, and help that cause. We would, we would very much appreciate that because we think that by sharing this information, we are, we are removing the fear and the anxiety wrapped in the disease, which allows people to live um, with the disease and not as it. Um, in addition, I hope that you take the time to check out our, our website, uh, www.alzheimerspeaks.com, and there you'll have access to all of our platforms, the radio show, the blog, the Dementia Chats webinars we do twice a month where I interview people that have dementia, the resource directory, which we'd love you to take part in. All you have to do is hit the partner with us at the top, and you can go ahead and input information Uh, share books and videos, um, businesses, service products, and tools that are pertinent to dementia and uh, caregiving for someone with dementia. I also wanted to um, let you know who we interview typically on the broadcast here. And at, at my heart, at my soul level, I believe this journey isn't about any one of us. It really is about raising the voice of all. So on Alzheimer's Speaks Radio, we interview people that have dementia. We interview families and friends that are caring for someone with dementia that have a a story they want to share. We interview business professionals providing services, products, and tools. 
And we also have had advocates and researchers on the show. So anything goes. We've had musicians. We have had uh, movie directors, um, authors. Everyone's voice is important, and we feel they need to be heard because um, every service that's developed is developed to help somebody out there. Uh, that's that's why we're all in, in business. And so we need to be able to share those those resources easily and help people find them. If you want to join the conversation, you can do that at any time. Um, you can utilize the chat box and um, just type in your question or comments. I'll be monitoring that throughout the show. Or you can call in live to the show, and that number is 714-364-4757. That is 714-364-4757. Four seven five seven. So that is um, that is the number to go ahead and call in. I also want to mention um, a couple of organizations that I think are, are really helpful. One is Alzheimer's Disease International. For those of you that are looking to connect um, anywhere in the world, Alzheimer's Disease International is an association of um, of associations. And so they, they are full of great resources, um, have a lot of research available. And today, again, we're going to be talking about their international conference. Um, and then the alzheimersstudies.com uh, has some clinical trials because a lot of times people are trying to, trying to check into that. So um, I just wanted to let you know that as a whole. I'm going to go ahead and... Um, I think I'm going to change things up just a hair here. I want to check and see if I've got Mark on the phone here because I'm not quite sure. We've been having a little difficulty. Mark, are you on the line? I'm on the phone, yes. Hi. You are. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce you then, and we'll go ahead and get the, the, the show started. Mark Wartman is the Executive Director of Alzheimer's Disease International, and he studied law and art in the city of uh, Eric in the Netherlands, and he was an entrepreneur in the retail um, industry for 15 years. And during this time, Mark was a member of Parliament, um, and he worked closely with various charities and volunteer organizations, and he became the executive director of Alzheimer's Disease Netherlands in 2000. And then from 2002 to 2005, he chaired, uh, chaired the Dutch Fundraising Association and was Vice President of the European Fundraising Association from 2004 to 2007. And Mark has now been with uh, Alzheimer's Disease International as their Executive Director since 2006. So welcome to the show. We always love having you on, Mark. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. So, uh, thank you. Uh, you okay. know that Jacob Broy, our chairman, is also trying to log in, but we had okay. some troubles. Yeah. Well, we'll, but anyway. we'll see if they're if they're able to to get on um, to go ahead and just click on the Skype button. If you have your Skype box up, and this is good for uh, all of our audience to know, um, if you have your your Skype opened when you click on that Skype button. Um, you should roll right into it. Once in a while, it'll ask you to upload Skype. Um, but if you don't have it, you can also pass on that. And then it should go ahead and call. Um, call the number just by clicking on it. I know once in a while the um, the frame will be behind um, the page that you're on, so you have to put it down just to see it and then to say, yes, please call. Um, but that doesn't happen all the time. But sometimes that will will occur with that. And it's not anything that you need credits for. Um, if you have Skype, it's just using the, the free system with that. So, yeah, in my case, it asks for a username and password hmm. to, to log in. Oh, that's oh, – well, and maybe because you if you weren't into Skype yet, that might be the case. So if you have your Skype box open first, then you've already passed that um, that realm. So that might – might have been the complication there. And then you're, I, if you're like me, you're afraid to give out that information because you don't know who's, who's getting it. Um, but that would have been to open up your, your own Skype. 
because um, it doesn't, it, it's not asking for one for the show on there. But well, let's go ahead and um, talk a little bit about your um, 28th um, international conference that you had uh, for yeah. Alzheimer's Disease International. And the theme for that this year was Action for Global Change for Dementia. And that was actually held um, April 18th through the 20th in Taipei. And we actually tried to do a show from there, but we had really some uh, difficulties with connections, and so we thought we would reschedule that. So, um, Mark, can you tell us um, a little bit more on the, um, on the uh, conference as a whole? Who, who gen- generally attends the conference? Well, it's a, there's a broad variety of attendees, so, and that's what we aim for, make it a multidisciplinary event. So we had a few people with dementia, uh, their family carers, researchers, medical doctors, staff of Alzheimer associations, uh, healthcare workers, um, anyone else who's interested in the topic, I would say. And there were over 1,000 uh, people attending. Of course, many from the home country, and, but also from other Asian countries and then from the rest of the world. Now, was there a walk that happened when you guys were there, too? I thought I saw something about a walk that they had done their first, like, Alzheimer's walk. or maybe Yeah, that was there, was a, there was a memory walk. Uh, okay. So memory walk is a walk for Alzheimer's. It's, it's now in the U.S. it's called Walk to End Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. But um, this idea of uh, organizing a walk with a group of people to raise awareness um, and pay attention, that's, that's taken over in many parts of the world. Um, okay. And which is really nice. And then the Taiwanese host organization, the National Alzheimer Association in Taiwan, came with the idea to do an international memory walk, and it was the first time. So we had people from 40 countries attending. And on a Saturday morning before the conference started at 7:30, um, and they uh, they recruited a lot of people from Taiwan through the local Rotary and Lions clubs. And in total, we had 4,000 people taking part in the walk, oh, all wearing wow. a special orange T-shirt. Yeah, it was really spectacular. And the president of Taiwan, President Mo, uh, heard about it, and he wanted to join as well. So he kicked it off, and he walked on top of the of the group. Oh, very neat. I, I saw the pictures, and it just looked really exciting. Um, what a, what a fun fun concept. Um, is that something you think you'll do with all your all your uh, conferences in the future? While you've got everyone together, uh, I guess so. It's it's something. It was something new, but it was so, such a huge event, and it gives also people a feeling that we're all part of one family. If if you can understand what I mean, mm-hmm. so it, it unites everybody around the world, and everybody was wearing a board with their own country name, the name of their country association. So I assume, yeah, that it would be very nice to do that again next year. And next year we are coming a little bit closer to you, to uh, Puerto Rico, and I'm sure that it will be uh, possible to do it there as well. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, because I, I, I think it is so important, you know, what you're doing, bringing everyone together around the world, because so many times we focus on our differences but there's so many similarities, and you know if we can focus on working together as one, um, it, I think we're just going to be able to uh, tackle this disease so much faster. Can you tell us some of the highlights of the conference? Um, I know some of the main um, topics were prevention and risk, um, nutrition and oral care, what we can learn from Asian care models. Um, there was a debate if a cure is possible in the future. Um, talked about um, public initiatives, and then there were some awards for the Chinese TV um, and three educational projects were just some of the things that I picked up off the website. Can you Do you want to highlight some of the, the things sure. that were covered yeah. at the conference? Yeah, I think we, um, we had a very uh, interesting, interesting session and, and promising session on prevention and risk reduction. So there's a lot of it's a really hot topic in the Alzheimer world, whether we can prevent or delay the onset of the disease. 
And we had three speakers who all highlighted um, quite a lot of research that's still ongoing or just finished. Um, and that gives us an idea that there is, uh, well, there's more and more evidence that uh, that many risk factors that are already known for diseases like diabetes and heart disease, that they account for Alzheimer's as well. So things like smoking will increase your risk and lack of physical activ activity, um, high blood pressure. And if you co control all these things better, then it may delay the onset of the disease. So that's very promising for the future. And the speakers highlighted a number of big studies that are ongoing at the moment and where we hope uh, that we get good outcomes in the next 6 to 12 months. Um, the nutrition session was also very interesting. So that was not only looking at nutrition from the prevention perspective, but more from how can we care best for people with Alzheimer's. And there's often a lot of malnutrition, especially in care homes. Um, if, if people don't get help in eating, then uh, sometimes the staff assumes that they know how what to do, but especially people in the later stage of the disease don't know so well anymore how to eat. So if they don't get uh, support with that, they, they don't eat enough and that will, that will weaken their condition further. And it's the same with, uh, with oral care, with dental care. So if they have problems with their teeth and it's not noticed, that might, um, might hurt their condition further. And there was a professor from Australia talking about it and he, he had a strong plea to, to pay attention to this. And I think it was very new for many, many people attending. Um, yeah, what we can learn from Asian care models is probably that uh, the people in Asia, that they respect their elderly very much, maybe more than we do in some countries, um, so that they have uh, good care models and, and programs for the, for the elderly care, although it's in many countries still in, in its early stage. Um, what they in, in the Chinese countries also still use the traditional Chinese medicine, which is uh, a lot of, with a lot of herbs and, and special teas. Um, then we had a, a session on public policy initiatives. So, what is happening in the, the field of uh, national Alzheimer plans? Like you have the the NAPA Act in the U USA mm -hmm. um, that's now in debate in Congress and. Uh, Everybody hopes that Congress will agree in uh, increasing the budget. Um, but there are more countries now uh, trying to do the same. And what was very encouraging is that uh, the Taiwanese government launched um, a similar plan now at the, at the conference uh, with a press release as well. And they're going to, to develop a plan uh, later in this year. And they hope they have learned from similar initiatives in, uh, in the U.K., in Australia, in France, and U.K. Um, we also had a speaker who is the CEO from the International uh, Cancer Alliance, so our counterpart in the, in the cancer world, who talked about uh, joint initiatives towards the World Health Organization for the chronic diseases. Um, so those were uh, you could say the main topics here, and then there was a debate at the end if a cure is possible in the future, and especially if it's possible by 2025. Mm -hmm. and we we had one speaker who said, I, "I don't believe this is going to happen because many things have failed in the in the past years." Uh, but the other speaker said, "Well, we haven't had any major breakthroughs in the last in the last 10 years, so it's not likely that we don't have." Mm, breakthroughs in the next 10 years. 20 years without breakthroughs is not very likely. So he was more positive. And he also highlighted the other things the, that we already know, the, the things we know about risk reduction now, uh, the good care we can give to people, the, the non-medical interventions, programs like uh, art therapy, music therapy, physical exercise, so there's a lot that we can do, and he was uh, more positive for the future. Um, yes, wonderful. 
Because yeah. I, I know that people really, you know, you go back and forth and you hear so many studies recently have failed again. But, I mean, that's yeah. you, you can't get a cure without failing. I mean, that's just part of the weeding out process um, of yeah. it. And I know that people get really... Um, you know, just deterred and and worried about that, but but that is the nature of the beast with research. Um, yeah, and yeah. One more thing like, about that is mm-hmm. is of course that uh, all the studies are looking for one drug that can help everybody, and what comes out of it is that it does not help everybody. But there are some groups of people with the disease who could benefit from these drugs. But it means that we need to set up uh, the trials, uh, the research differently in the future and identify the right target group for the right uh, treatment. So that makes it more complicated. Um, but I, I think it's still hopeful that uh, that we can find solutions. Was there any discussion, Mark, because um, this is my, my personal belief, I, I, I think that we need more um, support services in terms of not just the cure, but um, helping people learn to live with the disease and, and how to deal with it. Because I think right now there are so many what people term behaviors that can be um, alleviated if we know, you know, how to how to deal with things different, if we know how to approach it different. And to me, if we can get rid of some of those behaviors, we're going to have more um, solid substance for the researchers to go after. I mean, I know they understand the brain, um, and they can see all the specifics with their testing of, you know, what's connecting and what's not. But from a behavioral standpoint, which is a lot of times what they're treating, um, to me it would make sense for, you know, monies to go into that realm so we can help society get a better grip with that so we really know what's going on in terms of what's disease-oriented and what is um, you know, initiated by the environment that might be able to be changed. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, of course, I highlighted just a few items, and there were many more sessions, and there was also a lot of talking about uh, education of caregivers, both professional and, uh, and family caregivers, uh, how to deal with behavioral problems, um, how to how to manage the disease at home, um, and, and many examples of group projects, and that, that's actually a link to the awards that we gave because uh, we were able to give three awards for educational projects in different parts of the world, and one was in Argentina, and the second one in Lebanon, and the third one in India, who all uh, found methods that were fit for the local situation where... Uh, People could be educated about Alzheimer's disease and dementia to deal with it. Okay. Um, now, it looks like uh, Dr. Jacob and um, Daisy Acosta aren't able to, to get through, so I'm going to just kind of keep going with my questions here uh, yeah. with you. Now, the um, ADI conference, you know, is a, the multidisciplinary event that, you know, brings people around the world. Um, regarding dementia from, like you mentioned, family caregivers and researchers and medical doctors and healthcare workers and staff from all kinds of different organizations and policymakers. And, you know, it's just such a unique, I think, venue that you, that you bring to the table. Can you tell us, um, because I, I don't know if everyone listening knows, you know, what is Alzheimer's disease vision? you know, in terms of, of raising global awareness over the next three years or so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we actually agreed on a new strategic plan with these objectives. So our, sorry, our overall vision is that we want to improve the quality of life of people with dementia and their families. And the main objectives for the, the next three years are raise awareness about the disease globally, to strengthen and support the Alzheimer's associations around the world, um, to get Alzheimer's on the political agendas in all the countries. And finally, we want to encourage uh, collaboration on research between the different countries so that there is less overlap and less duplication. Um, We're not in a position as an organization to fund research ourselves, but what we can do is um, bring the knowledge together from countries 
from one country to the other and and of in research initiatives and see if we can make people working together so that which, the money is spent uh, as as efficient as possible which makes just so much sense to me <laughs> no it just it, it kind of amazes me that we that we weren't already doing that but i know it's very complicated um you know it it sounds easy and in a perfect world you know we just wave our magic wand and make it be done but um you've got a lot of i would imagine a lot of barriers that you have to work through to get everybody around the world to work together are, are there a lot of barriers or is that just my perception well maybe it's one of the main barriers is is lack of knowledge so um if people don't know from others what they're doing it's not possible to let them collaborate, but I think there is a, a big um, willingness to work together because the, the problems are are huge everywhere. And the, it's, it's, a not, it's, it's a very difficult disease wherever you live. That doesn't matter. So everybody's looking for solutions, and, and where, whenever we can help and make it happen, I think the that's not uh, that's something everybody wants but of course the mm-hmm. yeah the barrier is that they don't know of each other that sometimes there's a language barrier because uh, the, for instance in the, in asia there is research that's on in, in chinese or in japanese languages and if we don't have a translation uh, we don't know what what the results are so those kind of things are of course barriers but i think if you want it you can overcome Mm-hmm. Yeah, and okay. especially in the the research world, the, the English is the main language for for publications in in the scientific journals. Okay, okay. Well, that's that's always you know it's good to know, and it's it's nice to see that uh, things are pulling together. Now, didn't the prime minister just roll out something about a global research initiative as well? Yeah, the yeah. prime minister of the UK yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he said he wanted to put this on the G8 agenda, and the G8 is the meeting of the leaders of the eight uh, largest countries in the world, which takes place in uh, in June in in the UK because the UK is this year the chair of this meeting, and and he also announced that he wants to have a, a separate meeting in September, a summit on uh, on Alzheimer's, and. One of the things, I think, not only looking for research, I think the, the UK is also making an effort in, in improve the care. So looking at people who have the disease today and then creating hope for the future both. Uh, that's, um, I mean, that's a big step. That's um, it, it amazes me how much has just even happened in uh, 2013 in terms yeah. of, uh, you know, of being visible and in the press and the support politically all over the world it's i mean there's just this huge huge shift and it's just it's wonderful to see um and i know we have yeah. a long ways to go but man it's a it's a great great start that's for sure that's for sure that, that's true yes yeah one, one of the reasons is i think um that it's and then the reason it's going to the g8 meeting they're, they're mainly talking about economic issues mm-hmm. and the awareness uh with leaders like David Cameron, that this is uh, it's not only a health issue, but it's also a social issue and it has an economic impact, which means that um, yeah, that all all departments in government should look at it, not only the health department but also the social and the finance department. Okay. Um, now, in terms of your organization, um, do you have some objectives to kind of strengthen and support Alzheimer's associations around the world? Yeah, yeah, that is probably our main our main work. Mm-hmm. So um, the countries in who have well developed Alzheimer associations, like yourself in the U.S. and in the U.K. and Germany and Japan. Um, they benefit from our work because we exchange information. But in the smaller countries, and especially in developing countries, it's uh, it's more than that. And we need to help them to um, to set up and and build capacity in their organizations. So 
um, and, and that's that's growing around the world. In in the previous uh, 10 to 15 years, we had a main focus on Latin America and Asia, but now we see new organizations coming in the Middle East as well, in Africa, uh, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, where also the people are getting older and they get more people with Alzheimer's. They don't know what it is. So they have to start from scratch. And with the knowledge that we have in ADI, we try to help them and steer them in the right direction, uh, show them the resources that are already available in other countries that they can use and take over. Okay. And also try to train people in uh, how they can do that. Okay. And, you know, I know you guys work too, uh, you know, hard on, on getting on the political agendas, which I think you've done a great job with um, in terms of, of pulling things together. Do you have any anything else that you want to add uh, from a political standpoint um, in terms of uh, initiatives? Sorry, I couldn't hear that very well. Can you say that again? Oh, sure. You know, you guys also do a, a lot with just trying to raise uh, the political agenda regarding Alzheimer's. Yeah. And I think you've yeah. done a great job with that, and then we've, we've touched on a few things, but I didn't know if there was anything else that you wanted to, to add in terms of uh, what Alzheimer's Disease International has, has planned to continue in the future. Yeah, with sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the main uh, audience for this, the main platform, is the World Health Organization, which is the international body uh, that is supposed to to look at all the healthcare issues on behalf of the United Nations, um, where almost every country is a member. And just a sec. Um, so we try to to influence them to bring Alzheimer's into their programs. And uh, because it's such a huge international body, it takes time to to change their their policies. It's like an oil tanker, um, but it's it's happening. And uh, they they have taken up uh, some work. They have made a report in 2012 and launched a report on uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. And they're now looking into ways of. Uh, Supporting governments in developing Alzheimer plans and policies and exchange information about care. And there's also a project on uh, support for caregivers. Wonderful. And that's ma- mainly aiming at developing countries. Okay, great, great. Um, and we already talked about um, the encouragement that you're doing in terms of collaboration with, with research. Do you have a you know kind of a, a map on how this is going to happen, or are discussions just really starting to take place in terms of? Yeah, it has just started. But what we we are going to do, um, we're going to map out um, who are the who are the partners. So and in, in which countries are already funding research, and how much mm-hmm. they do, and what what the topics are. <laughs> Uh, I mean the, the, the governments. Then we will look at uh, the non-governmental organizations, so the Alzheimer associations, Alzheimer foundations that fund research, what their programs are. And uh, we work together glo- closely with the Alzheimer's Association in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, we can create a website where we we put everything together so that people can see what what is currently happening. Um, also for the researchers to know um, if you are specializing in a certain area, where are the funds to, to apply to. And I think the next step is as soon as we have a better insight in, in the overall research that we can talk about the research agenda. So what is what is missing? What are the gaps? Um, mm-hmm. how, can we, how can we do a better job there? Uh, for instance, there is a lot of research now on uh, on imaging, on biomarkers, um, also on prevention and risk reduction. But there's not so much issue uh, in research on social issues and uh, caregiving and good care. So it would be useful to to do some more research in those areas. 
And I think there's still a lack of understanding of very basically how the brain works. So I think we need more research in that area as well. I agree. I, I definitely agree. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask um, Daisy Costa, who wasn't able to join us, was um, her thoughts on kind of global development. And I'm wondering if you can share your thoughts on global development, because I'm thinking it's got to be awful interesting watching all these organizations continue to grow and expand and um, just, you know, pulling this formal reign with these new initiatives around the world. And I, I I believe you guys are having your second regional conference this year in Africa, if I'm not mistaken, and yeah, then, um, that's, one in yeah. the Middle East. And yeah. so maybe if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, there are five regional campuses. So we just had one in, in Africa last week in South Africa. Um, and bringing, uh, this is the second one. Uh, the first one was uh, the year before Mauritius. Uh, there are not yet uh, associations in all the countries, but a number of them do have them. So South Africa, for instance, and Mauritius, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Nigeria, they have association. Ghana has an association. We found out through the conference that the country Namibia has an association that we never heard of. Mm-hmm. But they're doing a great job, and um, and there are some some single initiatives in other countries from people who have just started. And by putting them together, and most of them are in the same stage, in a very early stage of development, they can also learn from each other. South Africa is a little bit ahead. They are more more organized already. Um, same in the Middle East. We had the first conference last year in Cairo for uh, the Middle East and Northern Africa. And uh, also in not every country has an association yet, but uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, they have, they have some. Um and then there's a longer tradition already in Latin America, where there is a conference for the Spanish-speaking um, countries every year. And in Asia-Pacific, that is uh, covering Australia, Japan, China, India, and all the countries that are in that area. And then finally, Europe has a, a long-standing tradition with the European Conference. Wonderful. Well, it's it's very exciting from, you know, a gal who's in the U.S. and her primarily stays in the U.S. to hear all of this going on. I just find it fascinating and um, so exciting. And I, I thank you so much for all the work that you are that you are doing, um, you know, on this mission. It is it's so so needed. Are there um, any other things? You know, that you, you know. Can I say one? Can I say one thing to that, Lori? It's not. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, I bring the information together, but it's thousands of people are doing this, and uh, many of them are family caregivers who see the need, and also medical doctors who see the need of uh, of the work for for the families. Um, I, we never made a calculation of the number of volunteers that's involved around the world, but it must be tens of thousands, maybe even over 100,000 people. So it's it's all their work, and um, we try to, to stimulate and we try to to exchange information. But it's it's really amazing to see what is happening and how many, how many people are doing this work as a volunteer and because they feel the need and they, they want to help others. So that it's it's very very good to see to see that and very motivating also for for me and my staff. Yeah, it, it, it's. Um, I think when you get those volunteers at the core, I mean, it's so much more than a job. The passion is is behind it, and the the sincerity and the authenticity in terms of the needs, and it, it's just so rich. Um, you know, the journey becomes so rich, and I think it it. It can travel and spread so much faster when you have that passion, you know, um, boosting you. And the grassroots efforts I don't think should ever be overlooked, um, but always embraced because so, so powerful. Um, They can do even, you know, like I mentioned here, you know, with our show being the the number one um, for Alzheimer's on the Internet, I mean, I sure didn't do that alone. 
that was because of everyone just taking, you know, those few seconds of time to click and like and share um, and and pass the word along, and uh, yeah. and that's 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 our whole our our whole goal here too with Alzheimer Speaks is just to help be a, a conduit to get the information out um, because there's so much wonderful work being done and so many people can't find it you know don't know where it is. To get a little over uh, overwhelmed with Google sometimes is helpful as Google and Bing are. Um, you know, when you get diagnosed with this disease and you go there, it's where do you even start? Uh, because there's so much information available. Um, anything else that you would like to, to share with our audience, Mark? Sorry, can you say that again? Sure. Anything else that you would like to share with our audience about the conference at all? Yeah, or? yeah sure. Um yeah, one, one more thing that we do in the conference is that we have a we have an important role for people with dementia, people living with dementia. So um, they present in uh, the plenary, and there is a, a special session where they can present present their stories. Um, that's uh, highly appreciated. Um, there's also some facilities for them to attend the conference. So there's a quiet room where they can stay if they're tired. Um, and we're trying to get some uh, some funds to make it possible for them to uh, to travel to the conference because it's often uh, the disease is often a burden to the families. So then there is a problem with the money to find the money to to attend. And hopefully for next year we will be able to bring a few more people. Mhm. That would be that would be wonderful. I I would imagine there. Uh presentations are pretty powerful um in terms of you know just talking from the heart and what it truly is like to uh to live with this disease um if anyone in our audience has any questions or comments you know feel free to use the chat box or again you can call into 714-364-4757 again that number is 714 714- Three six four four seven five seven. I'm sure Mark would be more than glad to answer any any questions that you might might have. Um, now, do you have um, your next conference? I would imagine you've got the date secured. You said that's going to be in Puerto Rico. Yeah, that's one to four May 2014. Okay, that's still <laughs> still a way ahead, but um, yeah, there is already a website. There's not so much yet to see, but it's. Uh, adi2014.org so adi2014.org and if you're interested you can go there and there is a a place where you can leave your email address so that we update you uh, as soon as there is more news Uh, people who are interested to present themselves there is a possibility to to submit abstracts and I think the, uh, the, the this will open in June and an abstract is a short summary of what you want to tell. Um, these are all collected uh, during the months up till uh, October or early November, and then they will be reviewed, and then the best uh, proposals will get a chance to, to present uh, during the conference for 15 minutes. Did you say 15 uh, or 15? 15, 15, 1-5. One five, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, and that's in 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 a parallel session where the similar topics are brought together. Okay. And that could be an opportunity if you have a project in the U.S. that you're very excited about uh, to present that. But then, of course, you have to attend the conference. Mhm. Okay. So, um, just so people know, for um, speakers, are are those. Um, compensated things, or that's just kind of getting yourself out there so you're responsible for, because uh, a lot of people will want to ask that, and I figure if we can just get that out now, <laughs> it'll be easier. So is is travel, and is there any compensation for speaking, um, or how is that handled? Every conference does it a little bit different. Mm, do you mean compensation for coming, or? Uh, uh, yeah, for uh, yeah for travel, and then for actually um, presenting. No, that we don't okay. have that because <laughs> no, it's already quite expensive to to organize the conference. So we need uh, 
we need registration we need registration fees okay. for that but there are, there's always some sponsoring and that makes it possible to um to reduce the rates for uh, caregivers and people with dementia and people from uh, lower and middle income countries wonderful wonderful well good i think it would be great if people wanted to go ahead and um get on that get on your website and again that was adi2014.org and they will update you with the uh, upcoming conference in Puerto Rico, and if you want to submit an abstract, which again is a short summary, um, to see if you can get picked to uh, speak 15 minutes, that would be that would be great, wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then, um, as far as people going to your website in general, do you want to give them information on that? Yeah, uh, our, our general website um, has information as well. Or this, is that not what you mean? You mean the conference website? Uh, well, we can talk about, I think, just ADI, because we've got the, the conference website they can reach from that, can't they? From yeah. Your, from your main website. I think that's still there. Yeah, the the, the main website is, uh, is, is alz.co.uk. Um, what you can find there is some general information about Alzheimer's and dementia, so what the disease is, what, um, yeah, all kind of general information, I would say, um, but also on our activities. And you can also find a page where uh, you can link to all the associations around the world. So if you're from Argentina, you just click on Argentina, and then you get the website from ALMA, that's the association in Argentina. And so all the way down to Zimbabwe, we have the list of, of countries and the links to, to their websites. That's okay, that's quite yeah. often used. Uh, that we can we can see that as uh, one of the most used pages of uh, of the AGI website. Oh, I can I can believe that. And you also do annually just a massive um, global report too. That's very very interesting. Um, do you want to maybe yeah. speak on that just to hear? Yeah, sure. So yeah, we, we launch. Um, we have World Alzheimer's Month. That's the month of September. World Alzheimer's Day is the 21st of September, and uh, in the last four years, years we released a report on that day, um, and we're planning now again for 2013 to do a report on uh, long-term care and the continuum of care, um, so um, comparing care models around the world and care, care systems, health systems, um, so that we can help countries who are developing their health system to learn from that. Um, last year we had a report on the, the stigma related to dementia and the year before uh, about early diagnosis and intervention. And then the first two reports were on the, the global numbers and the global cost of the disease. And this is all a lot of information from around the world. And um, yeah, we tried to bring that together and uh, give this uh, this background information, for, and it's especially important for policymakers. But we see that it's used by uh, by many many others as well. Okay, great. And then also on your site, I have to give a plug for Dr. Richard Taylor and and Laura Bromley with their I Can I Will Idea Library that you have posted there, where people can yeah. can share information as well on that. So yeah, you're, you're, I Can I Will like, is. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I can. I will is the is the library uh, for where you can post ideas, and then especially for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias, um, they put a lot of, uh, of suggestions into it, and uh, we call it the library because it has uh, different sections on different topics, and then you can choose your own one. And uh, this is an initiative that came from. The group, an international group of people with dementia, who met each other at our conference in Toronto in 2011, and uh, yeah, they set it up themselves. With we were just a facilitator, and everybody can can use that section of the website to post their ideas. That's a great. It's a great uh, way to share. That's that's for sure. Well, Mark, as usual, is wonderful having you on the show today. 
Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and introduce uh, Kathy Greenblatt, and you're more than welcome to stay with us if you can, but I also know that you're a very busy man. So, yeah, um, I am, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, if you talk to Kathy, uh, say hello to her. She's, she's a good friend and a great advocate for uh, looking more positive to Alzheimer's and dementia. But then I yeah. will drop off the call. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thanks again. And um, again, people can go to Alzheimer's Disease International and you can go to their website and you can find out more information about the the conference and all the different services they have at alz.co.uk. Thank you again, Mark, for all you and your organization are doing. Appreciate okay, it so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Bye-bye. Now. Um, before I introduce uh, Kathy, I just do want to highlight for people information um, that might be of value. We did do a Dementia Chance webinar on the 14th, and on that, um, that's where I interview people with dementia. And in that conversation, um, we talked about some best practices to communicate with people with dementia from their perception. We talked about how to use those testing questions that a lot of people use to kind of evaluate, um, you know, how are they doing, you know, when they have this disease, asking them who the president is and all of those questions. We had a really interesting conversation about those. And so uh, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, go to alzheimerspeaks.com or to go to Dementia Chats on Facebook and you can find the links to that. We also talked about eating habits and hunger or lack of, and then um, changes in body temperature uh, that uh, that they were dealing with as well. And again, all these things just give us some insights. And then our last radio show, um, we talked about planning for gratitude, and we also had Dr. Daniel Nightingale and Kathleen Nightingale from Dementia Therapy Specialist with us, and they talked about hypnotherapy And Linda McLean really focused on um, planning for gratitude, which was a a great conversation as well. So our next Dementia Chats will be on the 28th. That will be back at our regular time at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And it will still be the same link as always. And then our upcoming radio radio show, we're going to have the Better Business Bureau on talking about scams and then a woman whose husband had the disease and she's written a book Live, uh, living and loving a spouse with dementia. So with no further ado, I am very, very anxious to uh, to introduce our next guest. She is just an incredible woman um, doing amazing things. Kathy Greenblatt is the author of Love, Loss, and Laughter. For 35 years, she was a professor of um, so, uh, sociology at Rutgers University, and she has engaged in cross-cultural photography um, since uh, 2011, focusing on aging and dementia and end-of-life care. She has offered, authored over 100 professional articles and 14 books, um, you know, Alive with Alzheimer's and Love, Loss, and Laughter, Um, are her recent publications since retirement. And her expertise is not only in the professional realm, but she's been affected by Alzheimer's disease personally. Both her maternal grandparents were diagnosed with the disease as well as her own mom. And so this woman saw that the premier care that many often refer to is really about just keeping a person fed, hydrated, and safe. And Kathy's belief is, I think like mine and many, that we want more. And so, you know, she's been on this mission to really impact um, people and, and change perceptions of what the needs are and what is possible. And I thank God every day for people like Kathy and what she is doing. So welcome, Kathy. How are you doing today? 
<clears throat> just finally, right, let, let me just uh, say two things. One, it's since 2001, not since 2011, because I'm not oh. that heroic to do this much oh. work in, in just two years. Um, and the other is I'm feeling as though I should treat this as a trailer. You know, when we go on the Internet and uh, look for, for something about what do we want to see a movie, that mm-hmm. you get the chance to have a trailer and you can see it. And we've we've got only now, I see, five minutes left in the hour, and you had invited me long ago to be on the program. So I'm hoping that this five minutes can be counted as a trailer and that I'll come back and, and be able to expand on these things. Oh, I, I'm sorry we had a miscommunication there because Mark was going to be the first hour and I had you down for the second hour. And you oh, oh well, I can stay here. I, I'm sorry. You told you okay. told me uh, you told me the last 15 minutes, so uh, I'll st- I'll stay as long as you and other people are ready okay. to stay on. And thank it's, you, Mark, yeah. for staying on to say hello. So we've got yeah, we have plenty plenty of time there. Oh, okay, um, great. I've been writing okay. so many notes while Mark was talking about additional things to say that. Uh, I was saying I should just toss this piece of paper away, but thank you for for <laughs> giving us time to keep going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I, um, you know, I've heard so much about you from Judy Berry and Dr. Richard Taylor, and I, I was never able to connect with you. And the conversations that we've had, I thought, have just been amazing. And then when I saw your video, um, you know, I put it on the blog. And I put it out on to LinkedIn, and that was probably a month ago. And comments are still coming in with the power behind your video. So I want you to talk a little bit about your video, and we'll talk about the book as well. Um, but can, can you tell us about this video because it is so powerful? Sure, Absolutely. and uh, and I'd love to to think that it, it is my video in one sense, but the the real credit for it goes to a man named Paul Curley from BBC.com. And Paul saw an exhibit of the photos from this project in London last year. It was there with the ADI conference. So coupling my my talking with you and your viewers, or your listeners, sorry, uh, with Mark is totally appropriate because I've worked so hand-in-hand with ADI. Um, So he came to the exhibit, and he at that point decided that he wanted to make a small video about this. He didn't get it finished in time because the the uh the exhibit closed and you know the way these things work the companies say well once the exhibit is closed it's all over so they pulled him off and put him on other on other topics such as the Queen's Jubilee and the Olympics and the Paralympics and things much more important than my exhibit but he had been moved by the photos and he had been moved by the interview he did with me on the telephone for about an hour and a half so he promised me all year I'm going to finish this sometime as soon as I get a little bit of space and to my delight, that happened really a year later than when he had seen the photos. And he suddenly wrote to me and said, I know I've been sounding like a broken record, but the broken record is fixed and it's going to be put up on the, 20, on the 23rd of March. And, and up it went. And it's had more than 2,200 hits since that time. And I know many of them are due to your having posted it so widely. So I thank you for that, Lori. Um, I don't have the... The uh, the URL for it right in front of me. I usually have it because I send it to everyone. But um, it's a five and a half minute. Uh, um, it's a five and a half minute little video that really introduces all the themes and theses and many of the photos and why I did it. And uh, it's very hard for me to do anything in five and a half minutes. But he's done a brilliant job of making a synthesis of this. So I'm I'm really excited about this video. Well, it's um, it's absolutely fabulous. I mean, people said, you know, is it okay if I share this with our staff? And, you know, we want to use this for training. And um, it brought tears to their eyes. I mean, it just one no, after another. No, it's exactly what I hoped that it would do. And I hope it will also, of course, inspire them to go look for the, the larger set of things, either by finding an exhibit when it comes near them or by getting a copy of the book. But no, mm-hmm. it all comes from the book. Yeah, and the um, the direct link for that is www.bbc.co.uk forward slash and then news and then forward slash again health and then dash 2186285. Um, I believe you've got it on your website as well. I have it on my website. And if anybody goes to Google and they type bbc.com and Kathy Greenblatt with one T on Greenblatt, it, it comes right up to that and they can just click and get right to it. 
Yeah, or if if you go to um to, to your website, my, of course. My my uh, either the website and or you know they can find it there in the videos or they can find it on the blog. Just put in brilliant video in the search, um, <laughs> and it'll. it'll uh, I can't phrase right it that way on my own site, so I'm, I'm always <laughs> happy when people post it and put it in other places. And uh, and I've been getting wonderful messages from people from it as well as I do from the book. But this, of course, spreads so much faster than a book. You no. Know? Yeah. Yeah. What what made you decide to go on this mission to to pull this together with your photography? Um, well, uh, it, it started really long before I started. It, when I was when I was a teenager, there was a wonderful photography exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. Those people who are listening who are old enough will know how old I am by just that statement. And it was called The Family of Man. I was blown away by it, Lori. I just thought this shows that you can have beautiful photographs, but they can also teach you something, not just titillate your your visual senses and your aesthetic senses. And I dreamed about being a photographer, but as life went on, I, I made a different choice, and I went and got a Ph.D. in sociology, and I became an academic and raised a family. And I took some photographs occasionally, but I never really did anything very seriously with it. But but it was always in the back of my head. And in 2001, as my class sizes were getting larger and larger and my students were getting less, more and more anonymous because you can't have classes of 200 people and establish really personal relationships with them, I, I was less and less satisfied with the teaching role that I had been doing for a long time. And I got a breast cancer diagnosis and went through chemo and radiation and some small-scale surgery and said, I've had a really great life, a lot of travel, a lot of rewards, but what have I not done that I want to do? And the two answers were I wanted to live in Europe for at least a year, and I wanted to do photography seriously, not in the spare time that I was relegating it to, and I didn't really have any spare time. So I, with the support of my husband, I took an early retirement, and I said, okay, we're moving to France, and I'm going to become a photographer, and I'm going to photograph social issues that I think I can help educate people with a combination of text and images better than just with text or with oral presentations. And I think that photographs are really powerful, so I'm going to learn how to take good enough photographs to make a difference in the world. Um, and we sold our apartment in New York. We moved to Nice, and uh, I started photographing. And the last thing, I, I had no idea what I wanted to photograph. I only knew there was one thing I would never photograph, and that was Alzheimer's disease. Because my strategy for dealing with it, after, as you mentioned, my grandparents had, had, had lived through it and lived not very well in their last years, was to hear the word and run in the other direction. So if it comes and hits me over the head, I'll face it. But right now, I'm certainly not voluntarily going there. And, and the reason was that what I had seen is just what you were talking about, that, that feeding somebody, keeping them safe and hydrated was considered to be that was the, the what care was. And everybody was feeling that there was nothing else that you could really do. People were gone. They were beyond help. You could talk about them in front of them as though they weren't there. Um, you couldn't expect anything of them. And I watched grandparents who I adored be, be treated in very expensive places with that as being care. And I hated it. And I hated that idea, but I but I bought into it. And so I just said, I'm staying away from this as long as I can. Um, what happened, if I should go on with this, what happened was yeah. that, that uh, I started to photograph and I, I did a little project in Mexico on an old age home. That, that was okay for me because it wasn't Alzheimer's. And then I was looking for a place in the summer between the time that we were leaving Manhattan and we were moving to France. I was looking for a place to photograph while we, we vacationed in California. And somebody introduced me to a a residential facility that took 90 people, and it was called Silverado Senior Living. They are in many places around the country, but particularly in Southern California. I went to one of their places very reluctantly. I only went there because I was afraid if I said no, I didn't want to go. The person who was introducing me to that wouldn't help me find another place. Mm -hmm. um, so I went there, and I was blown away from the first minute. I suddenly saw that there was a whole different model, that there was something called person-centered care. I didn't know the name for it, but people were joyous. They were laughing. They were hugging. They were smiling. 
staff was sitting down and talking to people and acting like that was one of their responsibilities, not just making sure they got to do a meal on time. I mean, it was just it was just something completely different than I thought was possible. And and it totally resonated and I said, People have to know about this and I can't bring them here so maybe I can bring it to them and I spent the next seven weeks in that one place photographing and uh and that's what turned into the book Alive with Alzheimer's. Wow. It was really the idea, you know, I have to show other people what I didn't know existed and what I thought. If they saw it they would look for it for people that, that they loved, and they would make better demands on the, the, the places that they were going to or that they had somebody who was going to um, saying, you've got to do something like this, and that they'd know more about what to do themselves because we can do so much more than most people believe we can do. And, and I, I, I was charmed in the beginning of your conversation with Mark when you reminded me that your your phrase is from crisis to comfort and the phrase that's used on my book is from despair to hope, and they're they're so hand in hand that it is what you and I had agreed on the phone was was our, our really walking in step with one another, even though we haven't met in person. Yeah, it's it's so true, and the 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 power of all using all the different variables and mediums to communicate. Um, these pictures are just absolutely incredible that you've pulled together and the video um, it's almost impossible to watch it and not get a sense of peace and I just I remember watching it myself thinking that's how I want to be cared for yeah well you know I, I you mentioned I did another project in, in, in the last years I was side by side still doing some Alzheimer's photography but I was starting another project on end of life care and one of the places I came back from, my husband looked and said, why do you have to be dying to get treatment like that that's so loving and caring and full of celebrating the days that we have left instead of just despairing about about the fact that there aren't enough of them? And, and I think it's it's a change of, of mental set that's what I'm trying to help people have. I mean, it, I have a, an early, the early chapter in the book is, talks about changing brains versus changing minds. And I tell people often that what I'm trying to do is to change people's minds about people's changing brains. I'm a sociologist, so I know, as many other people know as well, that, that diseases are not just something that are inside our bodies, but they're the result of the kind of self self-confidence and self-respect that we have and self-image and that comes from the way other people treat us so when we treat people differently and treat them as still whole people who are still part of our networks of friendship and family and other things and part of the human race and and people that we want to thrive as best they can that 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 changes their way they see themselves and it changes the way that that uh, that the disease is is enacted. I mean, it changes behaviors and attitudes, and those aren't going to be affected by any of the pills that we're talking about. The failed, the failed uh, trials. I'm, I'm all for research, but there's so much we can do right now to really change the trajectory of disease in people. I I so agree. I uh, when I go out and speak, I I pose a question that everyone always is surprised, but I ask people what the common link is between dementia. Um, the flu epidemic, the fiscal cliff, and the mass shootings. And people will look at me like, well, there's no connection. you know. But it is. It's our care culture. It's how we choose to care for people. And with dementia, people get, you know, okay, now I, I have to you know, watch this person and be more responsible for them and, and assist them through uh, their, their daily life. And people get that portion of care. But like the flu epidemic, it can just be little things like uh, covering your mouth or your nose when you sneeze or cough or washing your hands because we are bigger than us. And I think that's one of the biggest things that people don't understand is what a big impact we have on one another by just subtle, small gestures. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I said, this, this isn't this isn't you know great science that you know says you have to go through twenty years of study. It's things by mm-hmm. understanding the power of smiles, of looking people in the eye and being patient mm-hmm. as you wait for an answer, of not keeping on saying, "Don't you remember this?" or "Don't you remember that?" Uh, I mean, the, the way the way self-respect is maintained and dignity is maintained is by by lots of little things by you know the, of that sort, and and what 
what Alzheimer's and other other forms of dementia do is that they put an assault on that, put an assault on your sense of personhood, and 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 it's up to us who are not the people diagnosed to help people maintain that sense of personhood and dignity. And the reason I think the photos are so have been so effective and have had such a powerful effect on people is because they show it. It's not just saying that. It's, I mean, I read about dignity a lot, and we've all read about dignity, and it's an important word, but but we need to just see that, that you can see in people's eyes that they still have a sense of dignity and a sense of personhood and a sense of being important and that, a sense that you can laugh and you can love and you can hug. Um, those are much more important than whether you remember what the date is I mean, somebody can tell you what the date is. That's easy. And if somebody doesn't remember your name, I mean, I know that's very hurting to all of us, but if somebody doesn't remember my name, I can tell them what my name is, or I can say, hi, Mom, you know, I hope you're really happy to see your daughter again, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, And it's done with, you know. But if I sit there and say, oh, my God, my mother doesn't remember my name, and I dwell on that, then I get miserable and I... You know, and all that. So, so it's it's change. It's changing our heads and changing our minds, and we can in that way so so much empower other people. And, and that's well, a lesson that I've learned from everybody that I've photographed and everybody I've talked to. And and as as you know, but both of us and many of your listeners have been powerfully affected by that by by Richard Taylor. And, and I have to add that mm-hmm. what you know that that I had the the joy last week of going by and spending a, a, a day and a half with Richard and Linda. And I can tell you that he looks wonderful. He looks wonderful, and he sounds like the Richard we know and love. And he's of course still struggling with the physical and fatigue from from this major surgery only a month ago but i i can't believe you know how well he's doing i mean i can believe it because i've seen it um but but uh and i took some photos of him and i will send you one in the next couple of days and you can post it because i think people will be joyous to see how well he looks oh great great i was wondering how how he's doing you know and i don't want to pester him because i know he's he's healing and i just keep sending him love and prayers and i know many around the world are doing are doing yeah, the well, same talk I, about I lead by example you know well richard is a very dear personal friend and uh and, and I, I was on my way to to see my son in austin and i and Richard and, and Linda have stayed with us when we were living in France, and, uh, and we've, we've spent time together. So I said, I'm, how about if I fly to Houston and get a rental car and come see you guys for a few hours and then drive to Austin? And they said, no, no, come for the day and stay overnight. And uh, So we had just a wonderful time seeing them. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, he's a very, very special man. Very special. He is, and 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 I I, I guess I should correct the impression I might have given that that the book has the the love, loss, and laughter book has 110 color photos in it, um, but it also has a lot of text, and it, it's much less text driven than than image driven. But the, 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 there are of course captions for the photos, and the, the photos are in chapters that are in different topics. So if you're particularly interested in one thing, you could go there. Um, and the captions I had to write because I had to say where they were and what was going on. So they're abbreviated captions, and, and the introductory chapter is mine. But most of the text that's in it is written by 40 other people, and Richard's probably the primary one who's, who's contributed to it. And that's because my years as an academic, I know how to put footnotes and references and quotations from other things. But everything I know about this, or most of what I know about this is not by reading, but it's by all the conferences I've gone to, like ADI conferences and other conferences and all the people I've talked to who are caregivers or people living with dementia or, or uh, professionals in various fields. And because I was able to show what so many wonderful people were writing about um, I got to, to be friendly with and to be connected to some of the top names of people who, who have written and spoken about about the problems and challenges of, of, of dementia. So I just said, there's no point in my sitting there and paraphrasing them. That's ridiculous, and I don't want to quote from the things they've written. So I just sent them all the photos and said, would you write some things to go along with the photos? So in the book, there's there's text that's in black, and then there's a lot of text, you know, from your copy, Lori, that's in blue, and the things that are in blue are all these 40 people, music therapists, pet therapists, 
spouses, children of people with with uh, with dementia, people with dementia themselves, psychiatrists, neurologists, that they've written to accompany the photos and help draw out the lesson that we hope that the photo will will highlight to have people take it and and put it into practice in their own lives. Oh, wonderful! Well, you know, when you were talking about you know the power of the photos, it really and and reading it in text, you know what <clears throat> what it means to connect and engage. But these these are so powerful because they they show they lead by example. They show the possibility. They they show. Um, I, I think one of the things that I love so much is how precious those smiles and laughter are Indeed. in everyday life. Indeed, and and it seems to me that you look at the faces of most of these. Of course, there are photographs of people who are unhappy, who are sad, who are are, are pained by the experiences they're living through. But that that's a small portion of them. But, but it's a very real part of it. I'm not pretending that there are no losses or that the losses aren't very very difficult to bear. Um, but but the real message is that. Oh, if we stop focusing only on the losses and we focus on how do we create moments of joy and bring out that laughter, that's a capacity that's still there and still there till very late for most people or even to the end for many people. And uh, and that's our job is to help people feel loved and to, to, to express our love and, and, and get it back from them and to find moments of, of, of joy and help them create those moments. So, uh, so I I too love that uh I think nobody can look at many of those faces and and believe for a minute that that person is not still here. Mhm. And yeah, not still I, present and not still reachable. And even if they even if they're not speaking to us, even if they're not remembering something in particular, they, then we go look for what 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 can, what are they responding to and we play that game and let them be the leaders. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really about us slowing down and paying attention. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I had to giggle. I, I had a friend who my mom has been in her end stages now for four years, and uh, a friend of mine is going through validation uh, training. And she said, "Can I use your your mom in my in my testing? You know, for my certification?" And I said, "Sure. She would she would love that. You know, if you want to come up and sing to her and talk with her." And so the first session, I went up and I I took just a bunch of short little videos of her, and you know, my mom just pulled out of her shell. Yep. Which is yeah, I've, I've seen some of the up. videos of Naomi Vile working with people, and it's quite extraordinary. It's really it is. extraordinary. And what was really interesting is good friends of mine I shared the videos with, and they all they all know me, they all know my mom, and um, every single one of them watched the video, which I'm sure is the same thing that happens when people watch your video. And they just got these huge smiles on their faces, and they asked me, every single one of them, there were six, six different people I showed them to, every single person said, I didn't think she could interact anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I said, they can always interact. You know, we might not be able to choose when that interaction is going to come, but we also have to draw it out. We have to do the right thing. And they were just amazed. And I thought, oh, my gosh, these guys all know me really, really well. I talk about these techniques and doing different things, and um, and I'm still not getting through. <laughs> you know? And so I think these the videos and the, the pictures are just so important because even though we talk about it a lot, we forget. You know, yep. we get busy with our lives, and and it's just something we forget. I I love the one with the, it looks like a little goat, and there's another one with the dog. <laughs> um, yeah, I put rabbit. that goat. I put that goat one in because uh, I didn't want people to think I'm saying every person's going to respond to every animal that you can bring around them. But you know, and that guy is asleep, and he's not interested in waking up to see the goat, and the goat's not interested in Judy Berry holding him and showing him to her. <laughs> Him, uh, so you know, there's nothing that works with everybody, but uh, but I have a wonderful set of, of new photos that are not in the video or the book that I just took a few weeks ago in Australia, and at, at a wonderful, wonderful place that I visited outside Sydney. And this this place is you know, um, I hate to say it because maybe Judy's listening or maybe my Silverado friends are listening, but the reason I think this place may be the best place that I've ever seen is because it's a public facility and it's it costs almost nothing for people to live there. But they put into action 
everything that we all of us you know who are doing this know are the things that make life rich for people who are living with this and uh and they had a family fun day and they brought they brought that's so what I thought about Judy and about the animals at at uh, at Lakeview and uh and they they brought chicks and ducks and and lambs and rabbits i mean it was there was <laughs> there were about 20 animals that they brought and they were going around to everybody and the kids were climbing around with the animals and they would bring them over to people and so i have a, a few uh, a few photos of those that, that supplement the ones that i had from here and that are in the book and, and that, that i'm indebted to judy for, for visiting with her up in minnesota um, and Judy is really a wizard at the things that, that we're talking about, about you know, oh, pe- yeah. keeping she, people she. alive and vibrant to the last moment. The, the cover, there's a, one of the three photos on the cover of the book that you have um, is a photo that's taken that's taken there of Elsie and the, the woman that I had I had been in India photographing in, and uh, and I had seen something about laughter yoga and I had never heard mm-hmm. of it before, but I saw a demonstration and I said. This is this is incredible. I've seen so many sessions of exercise at day programs and at residential facilities, and people look bored to tears. But I, we know that exercise is important, and that physical movement is important. But it's rare that somebody can make it very interesting. And here was this laughter yoga, and I thought that's what they should be doing at all these at all these places at these day programs. So I went and found the doctor who started it, and there are now, I don't know, something more than 6,000 laughter yoga clubs all around the world. And That, that was a couple of years ago. There are probably 12,000 by now. And I was about to go to Minnesota and visit Judy's program, and I called her and I said, I want to see if laughter yoga would really work with a group of people with dementia, and will you find somebody in your area or in Minneapolis and bring them up and set up a session that will run while I'm there, and I want to see it. And if it works, I'm going to photograph it and say, everybody should look for a laughter yoga teacher and bring them in. And uh, and, and she set it up, and this woman, Elsie, was there, and she came to the session very, very grudgingly. She sat there with a, a look. I can't explain it. You have to see the, fo- the first photo in the book, a look that says, you think I'm going to enjoy this. You are just kidding yourself because there's no way I'm going to participate in this stupid thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and less than an hour later, when it when it ended, she threw her arms around Jody, the laughter yoga teacher, and that's the photo, the, the big photo that's on the cover. And she just was full of laughter and joy. And, uh, and and if there was ever a reluctant person, it was Elsie. And I learned that that I was getting that photo on the cover of the book one day, and I I sent the draft of the cover of the book to Judy, and I said, "You're going to be excited when you see the three photos that are on the cover." And it turned out that was the day that, that Elsie was actively dying. And Judy took the book cover thing. She printed it, ran into Elsie's room, and showed it to Elsie and said, look, you're famous. And, uh, and said that brought out another big smile on this woman who could still respond to this. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm happy that that was one of, her last, one of her last moments. Oh, yeah, that is... It is. It's it's a amazing um, picture from beginning to end. And but you know, everybody that looks at it that doesn't know this or hasn't read the book or seen what mm-hmm. it is, they look and they say, "Oh, Kathy, that's a beautiful photograph of this woman and her daughter hugging, or maybe it's her granddaughter." And I say, "It's not her daughter. It's not her granddaughter. It's a woman she never saw before. An hour before that, um, and that she saw in a group, not on a one-on-one." on a one-on-one basis, and mm-hmm. you have to understand that loving care can be given by professionals as well as by family. It's not only that family members can provide loving care. It's that the right staff trained in the right way and understanding what their real job is can provide some of – they could supplement what the family can do and what friends can do. It's not replacing it. It's supplementing it. And nobody would argue you, you have too much love in your life. Yeah, but it's amazing. I mean, there, I've, I've been in some communities where staff are not allowed to hug or touch. Mm-hmm. Yep, and yeah, I've just, seen that too. It, and it's so sad because it's so powerful. And, um, you know, we all feel better with a hug. And, it, of course, we want it to be appropriate and and things. But, you know, it just it makes it easier for the staff to do their job if they like what they do. <laughs> Sure, but it, but it has to come from the top down, and that's why why Lakeview mm-hmm. Ranch is so effective. Is because it's it's Judy shaping what it is, and staff knowing what 
what what they're asked to do. And, and I mean, one of the things that so impressed me when I went to Silverado um, back in 2001 was that one of the rules was that if any staff member was asked to to, to converse with a, a resident, resident wanted to engage with them, they were to stop what they were doing. I mean, unless they were doing emergency care, and respond and relate to that person. And mm-hmm. if somebody else came along, um, at, they could just come and pick up what the other person was doing. So if I'm the cleaning woman and I'm cleaning your room and you start to talk to me, my job, primary job, is to stop and talk to you. And if the nurse walks down the hall and has a few free minutes, she can come in and pick up the vacuum cleaner and just you know do something for a couple of minutes because the resident has chosen me to talk to. Yeah. But I, I just found things like that. So 180 degrees the opposite of what I knew and what I had seen with my grandparents and and and, uh, and, and saying this is you know why can't majority. we do this yeah yeah, yeah. It's, so um, I'm trying well, to spread working that, that. Working uh, and then of course TV. love loss and laughter I mean what it does is it picks up from the first book which is all about one facility and and I was I was so surprised that I mean it's not that the book sold thousands and millions of copies but but it, it got a lot of attention the photos were printed really badly but but they were powerful nonetheless and uh and it got attention and I got invited to travel around to many places outside the US with the photos with a photo exhibit and I thought, well, that's really unusual. People generally don't want things from the U.S. shown someplace else because they, they're saying, you know, well, they're too culturally specific. But I was invited to show these. The first place I showed them was at an ADI conference in Japan in 2000 and 2004, I think. And uh, it was about the time that the book was, that the book was published. And uh, and I, I had to pay my own way. You were asking Mark about about. Uh, mm-hmm. Compensation. I mean, I had to pay my own way, and uh, but I got the exhibit up, and I thought, well, this will help me seem more important if I could say I had an exhibit in Japan. But what the way I justified it to myself was not only that I I could claim to be more important than I was, but uh, but that also I said I'll come and I'll bring the exhibit if you find me a pl- a place that shows high quality care, the best care you know of in Kyoto where the conference is and find me a cheap hotel and I can come a week earlier and you find, you, you get me opportunities to photograph so I can show that this is universal. This is, this is not something that's just about the U.S. that says laughter and hugs and touch and smiles and learning how to communicate more effectively. That I mean, these are things that work everywhere. So, or music. That I mean, music is so powerful but maybe the music is going to be different if I go to India or Japan or the United States or France. The songs will be different. The melodies, the harmonies will be different. But it doesn't matter. It's music, and it's effective with people everywhere. So that's when that's when Love, Loss, and Laughter started was with my like, going to Japan and photographing there. And ultimately, the photographs in the book are now from France, the United States, Japan, India. That's how I know Jacob Roy. Oh, the Dominican Republic, which is why Daisy Acosta is a friend, um, Canada, Monaco, and now it's not in the book, but now I have a new set of about 20 photos in the exhibit in, in Australia, thanks to their inviting me to come and, and photograph there, so we'd make the exhibit have some Australian content as well. Oh, wonderful. Well, it's just I think it's just fascinating um, what you're doing and how you're doing it, and um, it's such a huge, huge impact you're having on people. Now, you've got a big tour coming up. Do you want to tell people about that? Yeah, this is very exciting. The, the ex- I actually have two sets of the exhibit, and this is a little bit of an advertisement and an appeal to. There are two sets of the exhibit materials. It's a very big exhibit. It's 84 photographs. And one set is based in the in North America, and it's it, it started its life at the National Academy of Sciences for six months, and then it had a three month run at a at the gallery for the uh, the Michael Schimmel Center for the Arts in Manhattan, connected to Pace University. It was there last year. It was at Baycrest in Toronto. It mostly has been in storage for the last many months because I was very busy with with the other set and also with moving back to the United States from from France, so I just didn't have time to go looking for places. But I'm actively looking for places that would host it now. Um, And then there's a second set, which is almost exactly the same, that's been based in Europe, and there it's been hosted in Glasgow, in Madrid, in Salamanca, 
in London. It was at the United Nations and at WHO in Geneva, thanks to, to Mark and ADI bringing it there in conjunction with with their launching the big report that Mark talked about on on, uh, on dementia as a national priority. Um, and then somebody who from Australia who saw it in London in conjunction with the national with the uh, the international meeting in London the year before this not the Taipei meeting but the year before said we want to have this in Australia and Mark and I looked into the costs of that we've we've had wonderful funding from Nutricia which produces you know as you know a, a product called Souvenade. Um, and they helped with the cost of, of shipping and other things as they've helped with other things before that. And uh, it's gone to Australia. It's now there for a seven-month tour into seven states. It's in the capital of seven of the eight states of the country. And I'm on my way back there next Sunday for the big launch in in Melbourne. And as I said, they wanted to have it even bigger, so it's now got a little bit over a hundred photos, and some of them are very large photos; they're poster-sized photos. Um, and so it's just so exciting for me. It's going around to, to all the things, and it's it's the centerpiece of their 2013 awareness and education program to put these photos out in front of people everywhere they can and just say, "Look, these are people who are still alive, and it's our job to keep them alive, happy." Full of dignity and with a sense of, of personhood. So um, I'm hoping that we're going to get some people who are going to nominate this the, the Australian effort for the for an award of the education award from ADI for next year because they're doing just a phenomenal job of, of using this exactly in a way that I couldn't have imagined anybody would do. But it, it's great. Oh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic! Absolutely fantastic. Well, Kathy, you are just doing amazing work, and I'm just so honored that you were able to be with us on the show today and and share your work. So I, I highly encourage people to go to your website and to get the get your book and um, watch the video because it, they will be changed. Yeah. Uh, and and no... you said that people were asking you, Lori, if they could if they could post it and use it in training and things of that sort. Mm-hmm. And not only can they, I'm thrilled when people do use it. I mean, the whole this has been a project of, of passion, and uh, it's not been a. I mean, it's been unfunded from the beginning, so it's been just you know how do I how do I make up for the things I didn't know how to do with my grandparents, and I I, I had learned a lot of them by the time my mother was diagnosed, but but I haven't made nearly the I didn't make nearly the kind of family contribution that you make with your mother and many other people are doing so i'm i'm doing my penance i think i probably passed the penance period and i'm now just having a great time um and, and if i can mention one other thing that the reason i'm excited with the publisher is not only that they produced a book that is very well printed unlike my first book but that they were very committed to the idea of keeping the cost of it not the cost of general an art book with it's got 110 color photos in it which Usually is a quite expensive thing. Yep. They said we're going to make we're going to make this book accessible to everybody who should have it. You know, and that's everybody who wants to make a better world for people with dementia. So they priced it at twenty five dollars. You get it cheaper from all time, from from Amazon than that. Um, and the best thing is that. If anybody has anything like a, a dinner, a program of giving giving gifts to to, uh, to to donors or to anybody else, the publisher will will give bulk prices of twelve dollars and fifty cents each for the book. And so it's been used. For example, it was in the gift bag at the at the gala in New York last October. Four hundred people who came to that gala got a copy of the book to say, wow. spread the word. This is what people should be doing, and they should be thinking more positively about about the role they can play. In the lives of other people and not not dropping their friends or 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 committing the, the error that, that that I made and I made it with help but uh, of thinking that we don't have anything we know how to do and all we can do is wait for a prevention or a cure we should wait for that and we should encourage it and we should help support it but boy we have plenty we can do in the meantime oh wonderful and again people can go to your website www love loss and laughter dot com and and is spelled out love law lo- love loss and laughter dot com or you can just Google uh Kathy Greenblatt and she'll just pop right up and that's G R E E N is in Nancy B is in boy L A T 
And um, I just, uh, you're just a fascinating, fascinating woman, Kathy. I, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. Well, thank you so much you... for inviting me and for giving me this extra time that I didn't didn't count on, but I hope it was well used and well deserved. And uh, I'll look forward to our meeting in person, if not before that, in San Juan next year. Oh, that would be wonderful! Absolutely wonderful. Well, well let's, let's travel... try to get something sooner than that, but uh, but yeah. we can put that at least on both our calendars as a time to meet. Exactly. Well, you travel safe and um, you know just keep up the good work because it's just. Yeah. Um, incredible what you're doing so thank you thank you so Lori, much. and i'm glad to be linked and connected to you and i hope we'll we'll make it useful for both of us so thank you again for inviting me okay thanks for all your time today kathy bye, okay. bye. well what a fascinating woman i just uh, absolutely love all that she um, has to offer people and uh, just her spirit. Uh, behind her and uh, she's just touched so many and is going to touch so many more Uh, in wrapping up the show today i just want to invite you all to invite the next uh, invite you all to join us on the next dementia chat which again will be um, may i can't believe it's going to be the end of may may 28th and that'll be at 3 p.m eastern time you can find out more about Dementia Chats on Facebook if you want to go ahead and uh, become a friend of us there. Or you can go to our website, uh, www.alzheimerspeaks.com, and go to Becoming uh, Dementia Friendly. You'll find more information, um, and all the past recordings will be posted there as well. Um, on the 20th, we're going to be having our next radio show. We're going to have Gary Johnson with the Better Business Bureau, who's going to talk about scams. And you wouldn't think that has much to do with dementia, but uh, it really there can be a lot of people being taken advantage of with dementia, and so we need to make sure that we're protecting them. We're also going to have uh, Nancy Livingston with us, and she is the author of the book Living and Loving a Spouse with Dementia. And then on the, um, and I'm sorry, I said that was on the 28th. That'll actually be on the 20th. On the 28th, we're going to have Music First of Coral Health with us to talk about their new app, which is just a mobile app with kind of what I call music prescriptions, which is just fascinating and so useful and all research-based. And then uh, Janet uh, Calthorpe will be with us, too, on that show. And she's going to be talking about uh, kind of engaging people with dementia. Uh, Remember to uh, go to Alzheimer's Disease International if you are in need of an Alzheimer's Association anywhere in the world. And that is www.alz.co.uk. And you can also go to uh, Coral Health and find out about Music First that will be coming up on the show. And then if you're interested in a clinical trial, go to www.alzheimersstudies.com, and both words are plural. In the meantime, have a wonderful, wonderful week. And keep in mind, life is about progress, not perfection. Until next time, have a wonderful week. Bye. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.